Welcome to today's webinar in the Knowledge Mile series, part of the Lord Mayor's Lectures on behalf of Professor Michael Minelli, whose theme for his mayoral year is Connect to Prosper. In this free online lecture series, we address the connections in and around the square mile, which Michael likes to call the world's coffee house, and how these might help us to tackle future global challenges. I'm Professor Tim Connell, Chairman of the Gresham Society and a Fellow of Gresham College here in the City of London. And I'll be convening this session and moderating the questions and answers after today's lectures. Mm -hmm. The plan for today is um, I'll do a brief introduction and then Andrew Jackson, CBE, will give us the keynote presentation, after which we'll have 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Today we have a really interesting topic, Adapt, Evolve, Thrive, Keeping the Tower of London Relevant for Future Generations. We're delighted to have Brigadier Andrew Jackson, CBE, with us today, who is the Tower Director for Historic Royal Palaces. And I have to say, he gets to wear a pretty smart uniform with that as well. Andrew, uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about yourself. Uh, I see that you're also, strictly speaking, the resident governor and keeper of the Jewel House. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself, please? Well, thank you, Tim, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I revel in all of those titles. Um, and, and today, I, I have to say, I find myself suffering a bit from imposter syndrome, because I've seen some of the other distinguished speakers that proceed and follow my lecture, their biographies and the sort of topics they're talking about. And I confess that I was a, a really sort of inadequate historian when I was at university, focusing much more on the other things that were on offer there. Um, I then joined the army for uh, only about 33 years, and I find myself as a uh, on a very fast learning curve to become a heritage expert running the UK's largest paid visitor attraction. Um, it's been a quite a journey. So my military career saw me do all the normal things and operations overseas in Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, Northern Ireland. Uh, and then a variety of jobs um, known as staff jobs, where uh, you're sort of working behind the scenes to do things like defense policy, uh, work out training plans, etc. So uh, I did that uh, in the army headquarters in NATO and, uh, and in the Ministry of Defense. And then I was looking for this job and was lucky enough that my employer spotted the unique talents I had to offer, which actually, to be honest, are the transferable skills that most people who serve in the armed forces have, you know, communication managing people, managing resources, looking ahead at the same time as doing the now. So all of those things fitted neatly into place. And so, so here I am um, working for a charity, Historic Royal Palaces. Oh, splendid. So can you tell us more about why we need to keep the Tower of London relevant for future generations? And how do you plan to do it? Over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, Hopefully you can now see my slide. Excellent. That's all good. That's all good. Thank you. Um, so um, to explain the, the relevance to future generations, uh, you first really need to understand the thousand year history of the tower. And it's a really daunting experience to try and compress that into a short presentation. So, so I apologize to anybody watching if I miss out your favorite bits of tower history. Um, and before I start, I just need to acknowledge the help of HRP's curators and the authors of several tower histories and guides in, in putting the presentation together. Plus acknowledge the Royal Collection Trust who have the rights to at least one of the slides I've used. Um, everybody knows something about the Tower of London. They know that it was built by William the Conqueror after his victory at Hastings in 1066. Shortly after his first visit to London, he ordered the construction of a castle at either end of the city as a defense against the numerous and hostile inhabitants. It was originally a wooden building here until he ordered a much more permanent and impressive structure to be built in 1078. But it wasn't until 1100 that the White Tower was finished. People know that we look after and exhibit the crown jewels and the regalia has been kept here since it was remade in 1661. And you mentioned my historic title as Keeper of the Jewel House, which continues a post that's existed since the 13th century. People also think about the more gruesome bits of the tower's story, 
the location of imprisonment, torture and execution looming large in the list of visitors most frequently asked questions. And of course the fortress has witnessed this and many other events in its history. We've survived fire, war, revolution and plague most recently in 2020. And the tower has always been a symbol of royal and state power. It's truly a national and international icon. And such is its importance to the fabric of the nation that if some of our most famous residents, the Ravens, leave, the White Tower will crumble and the kingdom will fall. Delve a bit further and we can discover the many roles that the tower has filled. While fortress, palace and prison are the best known, it has evolved according to the context, adapting and retaining relevance through the ages. Change has been driven by the demands of the sovereign, by the needs of governments, and by social and economic factors. Many of the roles the tower has held have overlapped over the years, and, and so I'll attempt to highlight the apogee of each of them. The tower was built as a fortress, with the inner and outer walls completed in much the same form as they are now, by the end of Edward I's reign in 1307. I'll return to that fortress theme later, but talk first about the height of the era as a royal palace. And throughout the medieval period, kings and queens spent time here, living both in the White Tower and purpose-built apartments to the south. Whilst it was their most secure castle, with a notable exception of an incursion by the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, it certainly wasn't the most sumptuous, and the focus for the royals gradually moved to Westminster. Although their visits became less frequent, each monarch did spend a little time at the tower, not least in the days preceding their coronation. And they would stay in the royal apartments and spend time in prayer in the chapel of St. John the Evangelist before processing to Westminster. James I was the last king to do this before his coronation in 1604, a year after his succession. Charles II decided not to stay in the apartments, which by then were quite crumbling and decrepit. But he did ride to the tower and began his coronation procession from here in 1661. One of the many factors that may have deterred more frequent royal visits was the emergence of the tower as the most notorious of state prisons, accessed by some unlucky souls through Traitor's Gate, shown on the slide. The tower was never designed as a prison and had no purpose-built cells or dungeons. But it was a secure fortress designed for keep, keeping people out, and so it could easily be pressed into service for keeping people in. Ranulf Flambard, the Bishop of Durham, was the tower's first recorded prisoner in 1100, and notably the first to escape custody. He's one of around 8,000 prisoners, with the last, a German spy named Josef Jacobs, executed by firing squad in 1941. Many of the prisoners here were people of high status or political and religious significance. Some were allowed to stay in great comfort and even allowed to wander through the grounds of the inner ward. Others were less fortunate. Henry VI was held here after Edward IV took the crown during the Wars of the Roses and is believed to have been murdered while at prayer in May 1471. Edward's sons, young Edward and Richard, were also placed here for safekeeping by their uncle. But after he became rich the third, the two princes were never seen again, alive or dead, and their fate remains a much debated mystery. But it was during the Tudor period, and particularly in the reign of Henry VIII, that the state prison was at its most active. Many of those who fell foul of Henry ended up here, some to meet their deaths in gruesome public executions on Tower Hill, or elsewhere in London, others being granted the more dubious privilege of a private end in the tower itself. Contrary to popular belief, only six people were executed in the tower during the supposed heyday of executions. Henry's queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard are the most well known. Later, a third queen, Lady Jane Grey, met a tragic end in 1554, after only nine days on the throne. So, what about the torture? We know that this was increasingly practiced in Henry VIII's reign and afterwards. Instruments like the rack and the scavenger's daughter 
being used to extract information and confessions from the victims. We don't know for certain where this took place, but it seems likely that the basement of the White Tower, formerly used as a wine cellar and storage rooms, was pressed into service. Torture continued into the 17th century, requiring royal assent to inflict it. Guy Fawkes was a notable victim in 1605. The warrant signed by James I reads, if he will not otherwise confess, the gentler tortures are to be first used unto him, and so step by step to the limit. Comparing Fawkes' signature before and after his torture reveals how terrible his ordeal must have been. The tower had always been a fortress, and by the beginning of the 18th century, it had evolved into the administrative powerhouse of the kingdom, housing essential functions like the records office and the Royal Mint. Both these had their origins in the medieval period, but by 1800, both were at their height and had begun to exceed the tower's capacity, leading to their relocation in the mid 1800s. Weapons had also been manufactured and stored here since the Middle Ages. Some of the bows that won the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 were made here. By the 18th and 19th centuries, the tower had become the home of the Board of the Ordnance, right at the centre of a massive military operation. Although there were other larger factories and depots across the country, weapons were still stored and manufactured here before being shipped from the Pool of London around the growing empire. By the mid 19th century, there was room in the garrison for, thousand, for a thousand soldiers. The site looked really different then, with the original fabric of the medieval castle obscured by more functional buildings to accommodate the tower's contemporary roles. And it's in this period that the tower's evolution into its current form began. We owe a lot to the Victorians, and in particular two men, Anthony Salvin, an architect and rediscoverer of the medieval castle, and Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Wellington was appointed constable of the tower in 1826, and his reforms shaped today's experience. For instance, for around 700 years, there had been a process for securing the gates each evening. Wellington, however, decided to fix the format and the time of this, and it continues in the same way now as the ceremony of the keys. Now, at this point, it might be worth a quick digression into the evolution of authority at the tower. The constable was appointed by the monarch and took an active role in the tower in the medieval period. General Scorn Messenger is the 161st constable. He's still the king's representative in the tower, but he has only a ceremonial role as head of the tower community. He's also a trustee of our charity, Historic Royal Palaces. By the 16th century, the lieutenant lived and worked at the tower, responsible for the security of the fortress and the custody of its prisoners. We still have a lieutenant, Sir George Norton, but he has a purely ceremonial role. As the garrison grew, military officers were appointed as the deputy lieutenant, later known as the resident governor, and the major of the garrison. These posts were merged together in 1858, and assumed the responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of the tower. Just over a century later, the resident governor was also appointed keeper of the jewel house. So that's the ceremonial background. The important bit to remember is that only one of the current incumbents, uh, me, is employed by historic royal palaces and has responsibility for running the tower and making sure it's fit for the future. Wellington took a much greater interest in his role than many of his predecessors, and he set the precedent that is still current of having a military constable. His greatest reform was to bring some order to the yeoman body, the guardians of the place since at least 1485. In 1598, the tower's lieutenant had complained about their decline, writing, they are divers unfit for the place, some of them utterly neglecting their duties in service, others given to drunkenness, disorders, and quarrels. When Wellington arrived, he was shocked to find that things hadn't improved much over the preceding 200 years. So he decided that the yeomen should be drawn from the ranks of deserving, gallant, and meritorious warrant officers from the Army and Royal Marines, with long and unblemished service. 
The same standards are in place today, although competition is now open to members of the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force. The Yeoman body really is unique. Their role is now principally to bring the history of the tower to life, and their tours are utterly legendary. Some of the stories they tell you may even be true, and they must be the only staff of a heritage attraction that people actually pay to come and see and be photographed with. And they're on the front line when it comes to welcoming our visitors and answering their many questions. During Wellington's tenure, the Victorians reimagined the tower. This was spurred by the rise in the interest of um, in this by the rise in the interest of uh, the history of the Middle Ages and the architecture of that period, along with popular novels such as those of Sir Walter Scott. The gradual drawdown of the manufacturing and storage elements of the ordnance, combined with the move of the Royal Mint and the Records Office, cleared the way for work to begin. And between 1851 and 1869, Anthony Salvin led a team that removed some of the more modern additions to rediscover the medieval castle beneath. He added crenellations on walls and replaced modern windows with arrow slits. And once the record office had moved out, he was able to return the White Tower to something approaching its Norman state, including reconstructing the beautiful chapel of St. John the Evangelist. Salvin's work was giving, given added impetus by Prince Albert, who took a keen interest in it and suggested changes himself. Salvin was succeeded by another architect called John Taylor, an even more enthusiastic reinterpreter of, um, of, of the palace, whose, whose work led to the destruction of the old records office next to the Lanthorn Tower, and sadly demolishing part of the original 13th century curtain wall and medieval palace, now lost forever. By the end of the 19th century, it had been decided to let sleeping fortresses lie without any further attempt to return the tower to its original form. The Victorian era also saw the tower become an iconic visitor attraction, partly due to the publication in 1840 of William Ainsworth's romantic novel about the short and tragic reign of Lady Jane Grey. Before this, it had been possible to visit parts of the tower. The famous line of kings was installed as a symbol of the power and continuity of the monarchy, and the crown jewels could also be viewed. Animals had been housed at the tower since the Middle Ages, normally gifts from one monarch to another. In 1552, Henry received a polar bear from the King of Norway. The sheriffs of the City of London paid for a collar, chain and long rope so that the bear could fish for its own food in the Thames. A few years later, Louis IX of France presented Henry with England's first elephant. Sadly, this beast died after only two years. As the story goes, this was due to a diet of cake and beer, as no one really knew what an elephant was supposed to eat. By the 18th century, the menagerie was a really popular attraction, with lions, tigers, bears and monkeys housed in the lion tower at the West Gate. There were even short-lived attempts at an early petting zoo, the monkey room, until a boy was mauled by an overexcited ape in the 1780s. Urged by the Duke of Wellington, the animals were gradually relocated, with some donated to the new London Zoo in Regent's Park. Before then, they had captured the imagination of artists such as William Blake, whose famous poem was inspired by a visit, and Sir Edwin Landseer, who sculpted the lions in Trafalgar Square. The first ticket office, created from old animal cages, was opened in 1838, and by the following year, we were welcoming 80,000 visitors a year. By 1875, this had grown to around half a million, and today we're approaching 3 million each year. Since 1988, the tower's outstanding universal value has been recognized by its, by its designation as a World Heritage Site. Noted for its landmark sighting for the protection and control of the City of London, as a symbol of Norman power and military architecture, and for its association with state institutions. Fortress, palace, prison, national treasure and international visitor attraction. How do we remain relevant for the next thousand years? Before I answer that, it's worth running through another evolution in the custodianship of the tower. Owned by the monarch in right of crown, the site was managed for many years directly by government departments 
in the 20th century by the Ministry of Works and the Department of the Environment. After a period as an agency, Historic Royal Palaces was granted a royal charter in 1998 and contracted by DCMS to conserve five unoccupied royal palaces and open them for the benefit of the public. Later, we took on Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland from the Northern Ireland office. Many of our visitors are unaware that Historic Royal Palaces is an independent charity. We don't receive any money from the government or from the royal family and rely completely on income from our visitors, events, and generous donors. We're now thinking about how we remain relevant well into the future, evolving to meet new challenges and reaching out to new audiences. We don't just conserve the stones and serve up really well-worn stories for visitors. We want to change the way people think about the past, telling previously untold stories and encouraging people to enjoy the spaces we look after. We want to create really memorable, memorable experiences that stir people's spirits, inspiring and provoking change. And we've got an ambitious aspiration to increase our impact, becoming genuinely a charity for everyone. We want to break down the barriers, whether they're real or perceived, that prevent people from engaging with the palaces and their amazing history. For example, we've recently launched a one pound ticket for those who receive universal credit. And we're looking at how to vary our pricing into the future for those in what's known as the squeezed middle. And we want to encourage our local community to use the site in ways that they might not previously have thought possible. We do have some history in providing charity for schools. Since the 1600s, pupils of Christ Hospital School, once in the city of London, now in Horsham, uh, have now have been able to visit without charge when they're in uniform. And we're now looking at a massive shift in our education offer. We want to increase the number of young visitors and we, we are already funding an access scheme for those who would not normally be able to afford to travel here. The super bloom at the Tower of London last year showed us the potential of this area. Over 1400 schools signed up for our education scheme receiving seeds and education packs to grow along with us. And thanks to a generous donor, we were able to fund over 56 of these to visit the event. Some of those pupils had never been to London and some had never even been on a school trip outside their hometown. The charity strategy has big implications for the tower and its surroundings. We've got a really ambitious plan known as Tower 2030 to transform the experience here so that we remain genuinely world-class. We want to continue to remove the barriers that prevent people from visiting, focusing not just on financial barriers, but on issues such as access. One of our first priorities is to create a genuinely accessible route right around the tower, navigating the rough, not particularly historic cobbles. We've launched a project to significantly increase the facilities that support our education provision, looking at how we can transform some spaces within the tower to provide a much better experience for children, young people and community groups. And storytelling is our real superpower. Unlocking the power of history to inspire and provoke change, we want to continue to explore new angles to these old stories. Where's the torture really is one of the most frequently asked questions. We're looking at mounting a new exhibition in partnership with the Royal Armouries to tell the story of prisons and punishment, hopefully in the basement of the White Tower, so we can present history where it happened. We're also responding to new challenges that threaten the fabric of the fortress. As a result of climate change, we're seeing more extremes of weather and flooding is increasing the risk of overloading the Victorian culvert that runs around underneath the moat and damaging the outer walls of that moat. That's one of the reasons we're creating a natural landscape there over the next few years, wilder and less well curated than the super bloom, but aiming to address the risk of flooding, increase biodiversity in the moat and allow visitors to enjoy this natural space in a way they might not expect in the heart of a busy city, providing them a space to breathe and a space to really just relax and enjoy the tower. 
Our target is to become carbon neutral by 2050. So we've developed sustainability goals and are now looking at how the enabling technology for this can be retrofitted into a medieval castle. Watch this space for solar panels and heat pumps. Anything is possible with imagination, people, and the right funds. All of this adds up to a vast amount of work. And I'm so relieved that I'm backed up by a brilliant team at the tower and right across the whole charity. As well as our own experts, we are growing our network of partnerships and we're always looking for new partners to help in those areas that we're trying to explore further. And of course, we can only realize our, ambi our ambition by continuing to run a very successful visitor business and by attracting donations. So please get in touch if you know anybody you think can help. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the past, present and future of the tower, and I look forward to your questions. Well, Andrew, thank you very much indeed for that. Some wonderful stories there, um, as I almost would have expected with the, the Tower of London. Um, starting off with the, the question of uh, becoming camp, uh, carbon neutral, um, uh, colleague Ian Harris here at ZN um, has actually done work on the Energy Footprint Tool Project with the Church of England. Um, what do you do? Uh, I suppose you can't have double glazing in the White Tower or anything like that, but how would you actually go around trying to um, really be more sort of up to date in terms of conservation like that? Well, as I say, the, the greatest challenge is how to retrofit new technology into uh, into that really that that's sort on of listed scheduled monument World Heritage yes. Site fabric. There are ways we can do it. So um, we've commissioned some studies, and we're m moving our way through those and assessing them now. So we know things like secondary double glazing because the windows are so large isn't going to offer as much much of an advantage. But if we're able to cut our footprint by cutting our emissions, by changing the fuels we use, that's how we're likely to contribute. So we've got a program underway to reduce our reliance on gas. We're, we've got a lot of gas boilers. We're trying to replace those with electricity where possible. We're looking at installing heat pump technology into some places. And there are parts of the tower that lend themselves quite readily to that. Um, if you think of the casemates, the bit between the inner and the outer walls where most of our residents live, we can install heat pumps there uh, quite readily. We're going to be looking at experimenting with that soon. Um, so uh, it's uh, things like fuel as well. We're looking at how we uh, potentially use a different sort of fuel, the sort of biofuel. Uh, that has its own challenge in terms of storage. But we're certainly um, open to the idea of things like solar panels, um, they have a small gain, but in the right place will really help. Uh, as we start to build into that future moat project, we're looking at how we recycle water. So we're using brown water to irrigate when, if we do need to irrigate down there. So um, as, you, as you might expect, we, we've got a, a range of things we're trying to do. Some of them are quite challenging, but it's not quite as challenging as you might think. And there's quite a lot of potential there. Yes, very, very interesting. Um, one question which comes up about uh visiting the tower but uh, not actually in person. Um, Jane Warmington has asked, is it possible to make a virtual reality or augmented reality visit to the tower? Can you set up something like that? Yeah, uh, again, one, one of the um, angles we're pursuing now to you know, get our message out to as many people as possible is extending our reach online as well as uh, by encouraging more people to come and visit us. So we're exploring all of those things like how much do we put online? Um, there's a balance to be struck, and I think every visitor attraction will find this, between, for instance, putting the whole Yoma Water Tour online, or simply tasters that um, it whet people's appetite and persuade them to come. I think we're going to be more inclined in the future to put more content online. Uh, we haven't yet created any virtual fly-throughs of different places, which is, again, something other attractions have done, but that's, again, on the agenda in terms of trying to expand what we're trying to do. So all of these things are possible, and certainly you know, our objective is to reach more people online than we currently do. Well, that's interesting. Um, Trevor Hill has come up with an interesting one, which I suspect I can answer. Um, what happened to William the Conqueror's other London fortress? I assume this is referring <laughs> to Castle Barnard, but do you know that one? 
This is a very good question. I, I think I, I imagine it started to become the uh, the Palace of Westminster, but I couldn't say for sure. I'm not I'm not certain where that was located. Oh, right. Well, of course, people always joke about the uh, um, the the Tower of London not actually being in the City of London. It was actually there really to control the city. Um, this, is, like, this is entirely uh, true. It was built in that most strategic of places. So uh, just before the only bridge across the river, um, which was London Bridge, and in those days, for quite a long time and at the eastern limit of the old Roman city. So the, fort, the original fortress was built right up against the old Roman wall. So I imagine that the Western fortress was kind of at the other end of the, uh, where the old Roman city was. Right, yes, I, I think that um, uh, what uh, Trevor was asking about was Castle Baynard. Um, we still have Castle Baynard wall in the corporation of the mm. city of London. And there is, I think, a Castle Baynard street as well. Um, that actually, it uh, did survive up until the Great Fire, it wasn't rebuilt after that, and I think it spent some time as a royal palace. The other one which is much less known is Montfidgett Castle, uh, which was mm. also built by William, and that was to guard the crossing across the River Fleet uh, at the bottom of Ludgate Hill. So that mm. was actually right in the city. Um, again, I would imagine to keep the city, uh, keep it possible to keep the city cut in half in the event of uh, further rebellion. The, the peasants in 1381 seem to get in remarkably easily, um, I, I do have to say. But um, Mont Fidget Castle, um, that was actually taken down by bad King John. Uh, so I don't know whether he felt confident with the burghers of the city. I rather suspect not from uh, subsequent <laughs> history. Um, but it is interesting to think we could actually have three castles in and around the city of London, which would reduce the number of visitors you could have at the tower. Um, <laughs> lots of questions. Lots of questions coming in here no, now. No, what have the crown jewels there, Tim? Ah, uh, <laughs> no, I think that's probably the real winner, isn't it? <laughs> um, yes, now here's a real corker. Clive Bullen, not, not uh, spelt but pronounced Berlin probably, claims to be a descendant of Anne Berlin. He's therefore asking whether his family can claim compensation for unjust execution of the Tower of London. Um, I suspect you're not a lawyer, but the question might actually <laughs> land on your email any day now. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a fascinating question. It's a bit like whenever I receive questions about the Kohenor diamond and the provenance of that and its ownership, oh. I direct people to the royal collection for the answer. And I think the answer to that question might well lie with a different uh, agent than the Tower of London. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, you did mention plague and pestilence. And uh, the most recent outbreak that we've had with the pandemic, what was the impact of that on the Tower of London? Yeah, um, it was quite profound. And of course, it was not just on the Tower of London, it was right across the historic Royal Palace of State and right across you know, the, our whole sector. And of course, right you know, beyond that into many other sectors. Um, instantly, all our visitors dried up. Um, so when there was a lockdown, of course, we had to close down. We couldn't accept any visitors. And for us, that was catastrophic because we no longer had any income. As I mentioned, all our income comes from our visitors. We don't receive any money from government. We don't receive any money from the royal family. So we had to respond to that pretty quickly. Um, we clearly used the furlough scheme that was available from the government. But we also then had to start thinking about how we reduce costs. So we reduced our workforce by about 40 percent. That was the most profound thing uh, that we had to do. And then we had to start to reset. Luckily, uh, visitors have come back more quickly than we'd anticipated. Uh, last year, uh, we were back to about 2.3 million visitors at the tower compared to the th uh, nearly 3 million that we'd had pre-COVID. And this year, we're predicting we're gonna get about 2.7 million to the tower, uh, mm -hmm. probably about 4 million across the whole of the HRP estate. So we've seen a big resurgence of visitors. And again, other attractions are seeing the same sort of pattern. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not quite at pre-COVID levels. Uh, behaviours have changed as much as anything else, um, but we're probably at about 90 to 95 percent of that level. And significantly, some of our overseas markets have come back big time, like the US market. And for as long as they're travelling, we're, we're always delighted to see US visitors. They, uh, at the Tower, um, international visitors make up about 70 percent of our footfall, and Americans are a large proportion of that. Yes. Um, an interesting question being made, raised by Tom Billington, who's a professional in this field, uh, focusing on the delivery of projects and master plan programs in the heritage sector. Um, he, he's been having discussions recently regarding retrofit. 
and how many people consider this a new trend, but in conservation and heritage, he says, they've been doing this by virtue of any work carried out on this kind of building. Now, I'm at the Stationers Company, 17th century building, 1673 post fire, and we had to do a lot of updating simply to remain compliant with uh, health and safety and all the rest of it. And uh, we did have discussions with English Heritage as to what extent you have to either rebuild the things the way they were, or rebuild things that actually look as if they are a modern addition. Do you have a view on that at the Tower of London? Yeah, well, most of that work is, is conducted for us by our palaces and collections department uh, in conjunction with Historic England. We, we have a really close relationship and, of course, we don't do anything that, that isn't um, given the right sort of uh, schedule monument clearance and, and, of course, local mm -hmm. authority planning commissions. So uh, wherever possible, we are trying to um, get the right sort of technology into place without necessarily being constrained by making it look exactly as it did before. Um, it's not a it's not a retrofitting technology uh, question, but it's it's a slight it's a related one. So, for instance, we we're looking at building a moat, uh, a ramp that comes out of the moat at the east side. So, to make it truly accessible, we now have a, new, a ramp at the west side. We need a, a ramp at the east side so that our education groups and our businesses can get down there. And we're not bound into creating a sort of um, mock uh, medieval ramp there. Yeah, we've got designs that are quite modern, quite contemporary. We've got designs that look a bit older. And, and we're trying to find the best compromise between um, something that is appropriate for the setting, but also that something that, that is appropriate for the use of technology nowadays uh, and to, to cut down all the normal emissions and things. So it's a, re it's a really complicated one. And uh, yeah, if, if um, there's another conversation to be had there, that'd be really helpful because we're always looking for people who can help us uh, and, and advise on things like this. Oh, well, Tom Billington might be an interesting case because mm. uh, he, said he has a shameless link to his master's and PhD research. And he's interested, <laughs> in, the role, he's interested in the role of the client. Um, how do you actually make contact with your clients or how do you get feedback if people have you know, bright ideas about things that could be done with the tower? Um, we, well, we have visitor surveys, um, so the people who, um, who have been to see us are sent links so they can comment on their visitor experience, but they tend to focus on what the experience was like um, and how you know, small tweaks could improve that. We'd get less feedback on, on major things that could be done at the Tower. Um, clearly, our own staff have got ideas about how things can evolve and that we're always listening to them because some, you know, they've been on the front line of dealing with visitors every day and therefore know where things need to be changed. Um, but where it comes to the bigger things, we, we're, we're reaching out to as many people as possible to see what other heritage places are doing, um, yes. to see how they've responded to climate change in particular. Uh, and then to try and steal shamelessly any good ideas that, that we come across. Um, and I think that's the same in terms of um, keeping the visitor experience relevant too. You know, we, we watch very closely what others in the sector are doing. Um, inclusive history, for instance, is one area where we're trying to push boundaries a little bit. Um, we uh, are generally trying to establish ourselves not as leaders in um, many of these areas, but as early adopters. So. You know, we want to be amongst the first to be doing new things, but um, aren't quite in the position yet where we're necessarily the first. Do you work very closely with the other royal palaces? Um, so we, we work very closely with our own royal palaces, so, so the unoccupied palaces. So that's ourselves, Hampton Court, Kensington Palace, uh, Kew, uh, but not the gardens, the, the palace within the gardens, the Banqueting House in Whitehall, and then Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. So that's historic royal palaces. But we also work very closely with the Royal Collection Trust. Um, so, of course, we exhibit oh, objects yeah. and the crowd jewels on their behalf. Um, they run Buckingham Palace, Windsor um, and Holyrood House. So, so we're in close com uh, contact with them to, to learn lessons and share lessons. And, of course, we reach out to places like Edinburgh Castle and elsewhere. So we're, we're, uh, we've, we've got former employees now at Leeds Castle. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're quite well connected. Yes, Leeds Castle, of course, confusingly is in Kent, not actually in Yorkshire. Absolutely. Uh, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now here's another interesting uh, 
um, historical one. Uh, apparently in August, you had a study day at the tower on the 700th anniversary of Earl Mortimer's escape. I assume this was the Mortimer in Edward II. Um, but do you encourage more history groups to come for specific events at the tower? Um, so the, the core of our offer is for education groups. Um, mm. It's on the curriculum or some of the as aspects are on the curriculum. So we frequently have education groups who come and through discussion or live interpretation or simply teacher led visits sort of explore some of those themes. We less frequently uh, host events and groups, although you know, post pandemic, it's another one of, the, one of those aspects that we're wishing to step up and start to do again. Um, during the pandemic, we kind of compensated for a lack of visitors by doing more podcasts. Uh, we've got two amazing um, joint curators, joint chief curators in Tracy Borman and Lucy Worsley. Uh, and oh. both of those were often on online trying to um, produce new bits of the tower's history. We've got a team of curators who are always looking at um, aspects of history that haven't yet been fully uncovered. Um, I mentioned the inclusive history, that's one of our angles at the moment. Um, we've looked into, for instance, the Jewish history of the Tower of London, which is um, a, 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 an awful but interesting story. And, uh, and at different times over the history, they were both the saviors of the Tower and then were expelled from London via the Tower. Um, so um, a, a true story of how you know, a community can be um, treated in a particular way by, by a country. Oh, interesting. Um, now, here's a fun one for you. Uh, apparently, Thomas Cromwell wanted to be appointed as Master of the Jewel House as part of his growth in political influence and ultimate downfall. So does this office still have any significance in politics? Do you have a future <laughs> career in politics, Andrew? This is a question. I, I can certainly, uh, with confidence, say no. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it no longer has any political role. Um, for uh, for some time, um, it was a separate appointment at the Tower um, by royal warrant, uh, often held by uh, an ex-military officer. So uh, at one stage, there were, there were two major generals uh, bumping around the Tower, one as the resident governor uh, and one as the keeper of the jewel house. Um, and I still have a, um, a reporting line to the Lord Chamberlain, uh, for the security and, uh, and presentation of the jewels, but um, uh, that's as far as it goes there. Well, here's a military question rising from that, being a brigadier yourself. Um, I believe the Tower is actually home to the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers and the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. Now, if you had a thousand soldiers uh, wandering around the Tower back in uh, previous centuries, how do you get on with two rival regiments in the same, uh, same location? <laughs> they're both very well behaved, and if they're not, well, it's the Tower of London, so there's an obvious answer. Um, so the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers was raised at the Tower uh, in 1685, yes. and uh, for a long time they formed part of the garrison, uh, and also um, their depot was here uh, through much of the uh, much of the early uh, sorry late 19th early 20th century. Um, the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment hasn't been here for as long. Some of their origins are in the trained bands in London, uh, and so they established a, a headquarters. Um, in the tower more recently. Um, so their sort of administrative um, hub is here alongside the Fusiliers. Uh, mm. I think they even have offices on the same floor, um, but they, they are understood to be talking to each other. So that's good progress. Um, <laughs> the, um, the museum here, the military museum, it is for the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. Though, and so they're, they're kind of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the most well-known presence in the tower from the, the garrison space. So. Yes, and of course they're in the Lord Mayor show this year. Um, now, we yep. don't have much more time, so there's one wonderful question which you're looking forward to very much indeed. It's not an email from George Soros, I'm afraid, but it is from someone who says that he'd appreciate a discussion regarding various matters arising this morning, as he is a court member and committee chair of a livery company. So, Robert, if you'd like to send in another note to tell me which uh, livery company, I'm sure that Andrew would uh, very much like to get in touch. And uh, may I say, this Knowledge Mile series, we are hoping to raise the profile of delivery companies. So a very important part of the City of London. So that would be uh, very welcome indeed. Um, I'm afraid that's actually all we have uh, time for. So um, just to remind you that we have some interesting questions coming up. I'm intrigued by my friend and colleague, Bob McDowell, who's wanting to um, rehabilitate Judge Jeffries. Um, the man of the bloody assizes after the Monmouth Rebellion in 1685. 
So I think that's going to be a, a very interesting one as I've got some very nasty questions for him. Uh, then next Monday, we go back to rather more serious topics about uh, capital as a powerful force for global impact, bearing in mind the financial significance of the City of London. And then of course, for you more technical types, uh, Michael as um, a very technical Lord Mayor, is very keen on raising the profile of the importance of science and technology to the City of London. So we've got a very interesting session coming up on the state of play with fusion. Um, mercifully, I'm not actually chairing that one. We have someone in charge who actually knows something about the topic. Um, in the meantime, may I say to the audience, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we hope to see you again for another lecture in this uh, Knowledge Mile series. And a particular thanks to Brigadier Andrew Jackson. Uh, it's clearly high time we all went back for another tour of the London, Tower of London. So please come along and uh, do tell all your friends. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And this is Tim Connell signing you off. And I look forward to welcoming you again at another lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Tim. Goodbye.